delighted to share the stage this afternoon with Karen Dobre, who is a former director of and ambassador for Lewis FC. Um, if you were listening to Chris's session just earlier, I can't confess to have been blown up once even, let alone twice, but I'm hoping you'll be blown away by the story that Karen's got to share with us because it's absolutely fantastic. So, for anyone who wasn't there at the Glittering Awards event in November last year, Lewis FC took home the trophy for Best Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Initiative. And Karen, we would love to hear more from you about what was it that Lewis FC did to manage to win that accolade? Thank you so much, Natalie. Um, I think it is unusual, isn't it, for a football club to win an ED&I award. Um, but the thing about Lewis Football Club is that we are the first and only pro or semi-pro football club in the world to equally resource our men and women uh, players. Um, and that's absolutely brilliant, but it also tells you a lot about, um, can I say, how sexist football is the world over, right? So that's essentially why we won the award. But obviously around that fact are lots and lots of culture changes, um, that we've made and reasons that we have for making them. Shall I, shall I go on? Yeah, do go on. <laughs> Fill us in on it a bit more yeah, detail. Yeah, 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 what yeah. were the things that you did? Yeah, well, the first thing to say is that we became 100% community-owned in 2010 so that we are mutualised, which means that anyone can become an owner of Lewis FC. It costs you just £50 a year. You own a football club. Um, if you become an owner, you can also stand for election to the board. You get one vote as to who should be on the board, um, and you get one share in the club. But crucially, the funny thing about being community-owned is it changes your whole outlook and your agenda as a football club. So whereas most football clubs are trying to squeeze a profit for private owners, we are actually trying to create value to the community that we're beholden to because we're owned by them, right? So when you've been doing that for a few years and your women's team is doing exceptionally well and your men's team's doing okay, you might just start questioning at board level why, when we assign the budget, are we giving 10 times more to our step eight men's team than we give to our step 10 women's team? Now, although it's totally normal to do that, and I can tell you lots of things about football that are totally normal, that probably aren't normal in other environments, and there, a lot of them are to do with sexism. But you start to question it when you think about being there for your whole community and not just some of it. So you could argue that many, many football clubs for years and years and years have existed only for the men and the boys in their community because they haven't been thinking about the women and girls and there are reasons for that. Women's football was banned for 50 years in this country. Uh, and in many of the major footballing countries around the world, there were concomitant bans. Um, so culturally, uh, football has been a male bastion for years. You know, What we see on the TV mainly is men playing football. What we see in the sports pages of newspapers is men playing football. You would be forgiven for thinking sometimes that there weren't any women playing football anywhere, right? School playgrounds overtaken by boys playing football and girls around the edges. This is changing, I'm very happy to say. It really is changing, but it's still an extremely uh, gender unequal world without a level playing field. So yeah, so it, within the culture of community ownership came the question of what if we paid our women's team the same as the men. They already played on the same pitch as the men, which is still a bit unusual, but they were paid nowhere near the same amount and they were given no marketing either. So we changed a lot of things and uh, yeah, started a movement. I must say, when we were preparing for this interview, it gave me a small free son of pleasure to think about how uncomfortable somebody like Joey Barton might be at the idea of, of two women sitting on a stage talking about football uh, at all. So I, I totally recognise what you're describing in terms of the nature of football as a, as a very heavily male-dominated sport, which makes what you've managed to achieve at Lewis so phenomenally remarkable in terms of some of the efforts that you've made and the strides that you've you've gone to it, 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 can you tell us a little bit more about perhaps some of the barriers that you may have experienced because I know that there were two male 
uh, individuals who were responsible for, for ch challenging this situation in terms of the funding being so unequal. But I'm guessing not everybody was on board uh, in terms of the journey that you've had to go on. What was that like? Yeah, well, I mean, it's a massive thing, isn't it? When you say to people, we're going to pay our women footballers the same as the men. Because what you inevitably get is like people like Joey Barton, who, by the way, is very welcome to the dripping pan any time he'd like to come. Um, you get people saying, but women's football's boring. Or, but women can't really play football very well. What's the point of watching them? Or, no one wants to watch it. Or, oh, have you gone mad? No one comes to women's matches. Why would sponsors pay the same to be on the shirt of a female player as they would for a male player, et cetera, et cetera. You get all these things. And, they, and there is an economic argument there, but there's no social justice argument there. And there's no argument about potential economic markets that are untapped, right? because women's football is the next big thing, make no mistake. Um, but, I mean, I suppose the, the main cultural barriers, to answer your question, have been amongst male fans who thought that the women didn't deserve to be paid the same as the men, right? despite putting in the same uh, training and playing the same games, etc., etc., and amongst really girls and women who didn't feel it was a space for them to come to. So you've got two, two sort of uh, sides of the same coin, in a way, to address. Sure. Now, we, we talked earlier, didn't we, about the campaign that you undertook around Unlock the Gate, and we, we chatted a bit earlier about my own personal experience of, of going to a football game. And I, I'm not a, a massive football fan, but... Um, I'm in a family of football fans, so I, I went to a Chelsea-Liverpool game at Anfield and I swore that I wouldn't go again. It was an incredibly hostile, threatening, unpleasant environment. But from what I understand at Lewis, the, the, the experience that you have walking through those gates is totally different to that. You'd love it. You would love it. Let me tell you why, right? So, first, first of all... Uh, I, one thing I, I haven't yet said is that I feel, personally, that football's a microcosm of society, right? If, if you think about the patriarchy that, that we do live in, you know, hashtag gender pay gap, hashtag me too, hashtag time's up, could go on and on. You know, if you think about that, um, and you think about footballs being s so culturally owned by men, you know, and having such a strong influence over men's hearts and minds, you know, it is, um, it, it is, it is a, a place that's difficult to change, right? So I'm not surprised that you had that experience. So it has to be very consciously changed, and it has to be 20, you have to be 24 7 on with a culture change like this, right? So w when you talk about Unlock the Gate, what we actually, uh, first, I, I've got to tell you something about myself, first of all, because basically in 2017, when Lewis FC introduced equality, to the world of football, um, I didn't like football, but I thought football was only for men. I didn't know that women played football. Um, but when I heard that my local club, 10 minutes down the road from me, was making international headlines, I went to watch a women's match, and it wasn't what I thought football was. I, I felt very welcomed, I felt safe. Uh, there was no abuse, there were no hooligans outside. Um, and, and amazingly, there were women, young women, between the ages of about 18 and 32, um, playing in a team sport, being aggressive and um, ruthless and um, strong and determined and focused and playing together in public, on a public stage, in a way that I didn't see women performing, generally speaking. And this, to me, was... I mean, it, it's an overused word, but and I don't often feel it. I felt empowered by just watching them. And it was amazing. And I wanted all my friends to come, and I wanted my daughter, who was 17 at the time, and all her friends to come. And I wanted my son to come as well. And I wanted them to see women in this role, um, where being pretty or cool was a was a, not even a thought, actually, if it was. It might have been an afterthought. They wanted to get the ball. They wanted to win. And these are women learning leadership and demonstrating leadership to other women and men um, 
And I just thought it was absolutely wonderful. And the fact that they were being resourced fairly for doing it was more than icing on the cake. Because I didn't really want to watch women that weren't getting paid the same as men for doing this. And I walked home thinking, I want to tell other women. So to come to your Unlock the Gate campaign, um, I made it my mission to go to women's groups, women who probably didn't like football, because I'd get an audience like this and I'd say, who here has been to a football match? Maybe one or two hands went up. They've seen it on the telly, but they don't go to football matches. Who's been to a women's football match? Not one hand would go up. So I would invite them all. And I said to them, that if you come to this particular women's football match, you will be making a stand for equality because you will be counted at the gate. And the gate figures are our problem. You know, this is, our critics are saying that the women don't get as many crowds as the men. Can we, Lewis FC has been bold, has been brave, has put their hand into their own pocket to, to raise the women's playing budget to meet the men's. Can we let them lose in this male-dominated sport? Are we okay with that as women? Turns out we weren't. Unlock the Gate was in 2018, the same year as the centenary of suffrage. And we organized, and not just me, like these new women who are a new market for Lewis FC and who are coming through the gate, organized suffragette flash mobs to march to the dripping pan. We, they bought, the Women's Institute bought red and black velvet cake to our matches because we're red and black and, and that's what they do, they make cake. And then we had, uh, I don't know, we, had, we set the Guinness World Record for how many people in suffrage costume at a football match. Um, Emmeline Pankhurst's great-granddaughter, Helen Pankhurst, came down to Dripping Pan, rallied the terraces before a match to tell us all about deeds, not words, and why Emmeline would have been at a women's football match now. Were she alive? You know, we had, we, we had fun as well. That, I mean, that was fun. But we also had thematic matches. We, had Prosec we have Prosecco on tap. We have vegan food. We have oat milk for your tea or your coffee. Why should, why should you get it in Costa and not be able to get it at a football match? And we've got, as soon as you walk in the door, turnstile rather, you see a breastfeeding sign where you can breastfeed if you want to. Go around the corner, past the chip hut. What have you got? I'll tell you what you've got. You've got an eight foot high statue of 18th century female pirates, bisexual ones actually, uh, who watch the match in the direction of the sea. Representation matters if you're tra changing culture. What are people gonna see when they come through the door to make them feel that they belong, to make them feel that this is a place that's also for them? So we've thought about these things and it's all part of our campaigning to be inclusive to what we call um, unwelcome women. And I think it's really interesting that how the extent to which the proof is in the pudding, because you talked about the gate numbers there. So um, from what I understand it, because of the financial situation the club was in, there was an increase in ticket prices. And yet, despite that, you quadrupled the gate? Yeah, no, I'm, we quadrupled the gate in two seasons. Why? Because people are angry about inequality and they want to do something about it. This is, this is profit and purpose united, right? So we, got, we quadrupled the gate in two seasons, but now we've gone even further. And our average gate figures for men... In, oh, and by the way, the men's gate went up too, right, because of the buzz around equality. So it was like... It, it, we say equality is a rising tide that lifts all our boats, and we're not joking. We've put the ticket prices up incrementally for the women year on year. This season, they've been exactly the same as the men's. We've reached £13 each. It's £13... Under 16s go free. Well behaved dogs are welcome. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it, it's working for us. We've got massive sponsors on board. I think when we got Lyle and Scott on the front of our shirts, it was the biggest sponsorship deal for a women's team um, so far, and that was in 2021. Now, now we've got Zero sponsoring us as well, and before they sponsored us, they, did some, they commissioned some research and they found that after the Lionesses, Lewis FC women are the most affinity aware women's football team in England, um, which I'm not even sure what that means, but I think it means we're famous. <laughs> I think that's what that means. And it can really only be for equality. I mean, it's crazy, right? We're a, we're a small football club. We won the, the small award, right, for the EDI. We're a small football club, but we played Manchester United last season. You know, season before that, we beat Liverpool. Uh, we, we play these massive clubs because... 
And I tell you why, because they are sexist clubs, right? Who don't, haven't put enough money behind their women's team to get them right to the top of the Super League. I mean, Manchester United have now, and Liverpool did get promoted the season before. But I mean, you know, how did Lewis, a club of our size, get to be playing all these teams? You know, and at the moment, we're in the third tier, which is still pretty good. Um, we don't have a big men's team to pass money over the table and give us what we might call housekeeping money. We have to make all this money ourselves. And I can tell you for a fact that the se last season, Lewis FC made more money than Arsenal women in sponsorship. Why? Because of equality. So it's a great, you know, it's, it's a great case study for um, if you really do have great principles and morals, how in this world they can actually make you money because people do want to have purpose, you know, and they do want meaning with their pounds that they, or dollars that they spend. I forgot to say, you know, we've got owners in 42 countries around the world. And I was telling Natalie earlier that 15% of them are in North America and we don't really know why, apart from they must be angry. I mean, it's a, just a, such a phenomenal story. And when I was thinking about stickability, so we heard in the panellist discussion before Chris came on about how important it is to really seed culture throughout your organisation. So at Culture Consultancy, we spend a lot of time working with clients, not on the splashy stuff, you know, not on the things that you laminate and you put on the, work, on the walls, but the things that really make a difference to everyday experiences. So, you know, what have you done at Lewis FC that's really kind of maintained that um, seismic shift that you've made and that culture change that you're affecting? What has been key to that? So earlier I, I used the word movement, you know, and I used it quite deliberately because I think what we've done... Um, now having over 2,500 owners, most of whom will never get to the dripping pan to actually watch a match, right? But what we've done is, through our shared values, we've attracted people to our football club or to support our football club in some way, because many of our owners, um, you know, will do things for us. And <laughs> it's fabulous. Um, like the lights, for example. You needed to fund some lights, didn't you, that for the lighting for the, for the pitch? Yeah, the yeah. crowd... crowd yeah. yeah, well... Yeah, we crowdfunded the lights, we crowdfunded our training pitch, our all-weather pitch. We've, we've done lots of crowdfunding, but also they, they might offer particular skills, like, you know, Dave Lamb, who is the voice of Come Dine With Me, for example, is one of our owners and has done our, a video for us. You know, like, it's things like this, right? Mm -hmm. But we've, I've, I mean, we've attracted, we've attracted an amazing CEO that comes from a background of human rights and advocacy. Again, on our men's team, we've got a midfielder who only signed his contract on the basis that he could build a community garden within our ground, where now we grow good food and good relationships. <laughs> we have lots of volunteers come in. And we have had an amazing head of performance who was the woman who coached the Afghan women's team and called out the sexual, sexual abuse scandal there. And then um, when the Taliban took control a few years ago, helped airlift them all out of Kabul. I mean, we, we've we, we get such... I'm so privileged to work with some of the people that are owners, directors, fans, supporters and staff at Lewis FC. I, I honestly am. And what it is, is, is putting out our purpose all the time, reasserting it in different ways, any way that we can, whether it's the sponsors we align with, the partners we align with, the, the, uh, the publicity we get, the crazy, quirky things we do, because we survive on quirks sometimes because of our size. Um, you know, beat charts instead of corporate boxes, we run a literary competition called the Rooker Prize instead of the Booker because we're the Rooks. You know, all those things for our owners. I think you just have to keep reasserting culture, keep thinking about the different ways in which you can say that you are different because we are disruptors and we're going against a trend and we must never forget that because that's where our value lies. It's such a powerful story, Karen, and I think, yeah, that disruptive influence in football, what you've described is a, a world of football that's probably totally unrecognisable to you've most people. Come. You've got to come, and you've all got to come, because it's not... I'm, do you want to... Oh, you're coming. Oh, excellent, thank you very much. <laughs> because it really... I'm not just saying this stuff, you know. We walk the walk. We are different, and um, there's a bit of magic in the air at the Dripping Pan. We create change. In fact, on that note, 
<laughs> Just a really timely gift on a hot day in London. I was delighted to be presented with an actual fan of change because Lewis FC are fans of change. Um, so I just really wanted to close by saying, Karen, thank you for sharing such an amazingly powerful story with us about the difference that Lewis FC has made to equality in football. Well, thank you for having me and thank you for stepping in at the last minute, Natalie. It's a pleasure. Woo! Hooray for <laughs> Natalie. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.